I'm completing the entire mainline Pokemon franchise in chronological order with two challenges standing in front of me. The first, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in all 39 mainline Pokemon games released in North America, and the second, no repeat Pokemon may be used. I've already played five previous Kanto games in red, blue, yellow, fire red, leaf green, videos are in the description, so how in the world am I going to get through two more with so few remaining Pokemon? Well, let's find out. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any parts of this series, and since we're making the push to 200,000 subscribers with your help by the end of 2023. Let's get right into it. So let's go over some really interesting games. While the mechanic of catching Pokemon is ripped straight from the smartphone-only Pokemon Go, everything else is basically as you'd expect. However, our starters are going to have to go unused since they're forced upon you in prior games and had to be used in battle, with Pikachu in Yellow version and Eevee in Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. But before we jump into this pair of games, a mistake that happened in my last upload was that the end of the champion fight for Ultra Moon was cut off due to a rendering error, but all you need to know is that Krabominal died a horrible death via Pokemon's version of a slasher film, and this is what our used Pokemon count is looking like. Now in the last video, I also stated that I wanted to beat Generation 8 by using 493 or less Pokemon, since it's kind of fitting with that being the final Pokemon in Gen 4 with Arceus, and the last game in Gen 8 is Legends Arceus, you get it, it's a stupid arbitrary number. With that aside though, we're able to collect our Pikachu and get out to Route 1, and thankfully because Let's Go added some new Pokemon to the beginning of the games, we're able to capture our first legal encounter in Oddish on Route 1. If you recall in the Gen 2 video, I did end up capturing one of these, but I never used it nor Gloom in battle, evolving it into Blossom since that Pokemon's unavailable here in Let's Go, so we're able to use the whole line here. Although, if I'm gonna make it through 7 more games with 493 or less Pokemon, I think we're gonna need to take some drastic measures. It's time to chain hundreds of Oddishes together for candy. While you would think we're limited by the amount of money we start off with here, by chaining Oddish together, we're able to get a bunch of stat-specific candies that can be, in turn, sold for additional cash. With all of this cash, and the balls, and all of the Pokémon, we're able to transfer them away to Professor Oak, and in turn, get Oddish candy. These increase all of the stats of that individual species that they're made for, and somehow, some way, because of them, a level 8 Oddish is able to have all stats above 200. Alright, well, time to blow through the game. One Viridian Forest trip later and we're in Pewter City to challenge Brock. And since we have both super effective attacks plus ridiculous stats, two Absorbs are able to KO both Geodude and Onyx in one shot, winning me the Boulder Badge. You know, thank goodness this game doesn't have abilities, otherwise that might have been tough. I mean, what if Geodude could have tackled Oddish? That would have been a disaster. But before we can get into the rest of the badges, I want to talk about this video sponsor, War Thunder. Have you ever dreamed of experiencing the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made? Well, look no further than War Thunder. In War Thunder, you can dive into intense, dynamic combined arms PvP battles with a collection of over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships. Every vehicle is meticulously detailed, right down to their individual components, delivering a truly immersive combat experience. What's more, War Thunder spans over 100 years of vehicle development, from the 1920s all the way till today. You can customize your vehicles like never before with hundreds of camouflages, historical markings, and 3D decorators like bushes and equipment. The game boasts incredible 4K graphics, authentic sound effects, and stunning music that fully immerses you in the action. And guess what? You can fly any aircraft with just a mouse and keyboard thanks to the intuitive mouse aim mode. Personally, I'm blown away by the incredibly detailed fire, smoke, and vehicle damage effects. It adds a whole new level of realism to the game. So what are you waiting for? Play War Thunder today for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox using my link in the pinned comment below. And here's the exciting part. If you're a new player or haven't played for at least six months, you can claim a massive bonus package through my link. It includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, and an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicle, and much more. But hurry, it's only available for a limited time. With our first badge in hand, we exit the gym, get some blue balls, and head on through Mount Moon, encountering Jesse and James for the first time since, technically, this is a remake of Yellow Version. 
They of course want a double battle because future game mechanics, so I'm gonna have to draft in Pikachu and use a non-damaging attack to ensure it doesn't affect the outcome of the fight, which as expected comes to be Oddish hitting Acid twice to KO both since it's a multi-targeting move. I guess with even these high stats, resistance can still be a problem with low power moves. All good though, since for future battles I have access to growth in case things go south. Heading into Cerulean City, we're able to take on Misty, but I'd rather head on through Routes 24 and 25 first, taking on our rival for the first time. He's named Poopyhead. When we spell it out, you're a poopyhead. Because I'm an idiot. His team all faints to one acid apiece, letting me head through the route, grab the SS tickets, and then fight Misty well below the level cap of 19, because who cares? Oddish is god in this realm. Two Absorbs are able to handle Psyduck and Starmie, giving me the Cascade Badge and the ability to head down into Vermilion City to the south. Of course, the SSN houses a rival battle, easily swept through thanks to Acid one-shotting Pidgeotto, though admittedly we're starting to get to the point in the game where stuff won't go down in one shot with these weak moves. So Eevee takes two shots of Acid before overdosing, but Oddish is still susceptible to a one-shot, winning me the fight and getting Pikachu chopped down. That's right, you yellow rat bastard, you're my HM Mule now! Now that we're done there, though, we're... Oh, you. Stay in Alola where you belong, please. I don't want to even remember those games exist for several months. Yet here you are. Anyway, we're able to fight Surge right after, taking out Voltorb with two Absorbs, then two Headbutts for Magnemite, leaving just Raichu, who actually takes three hits to finally fall. Sure, one was a critical hit, but that's even worse since that means our offensive potency is drastically decreasing. We really need to get some new moves if we're gonna... Oh, who am I kidding? I literally have 200 HP and over 200 both defense stats. We are fine. One rock tunnel... Later, and we're in Lavender Town, forced into the Pokemon Tower for a rival battle that goes rather smoothly with Acid, as Pidgeotto takes three of them following a healing item, Gloom takes two of them while reciprocating with one of its own, and the newly evolved Jolteon falls to two of them following two quick attacks. It's hardly worth mentioning the attacks though, since they've done so little damage that I don't think Oddish has dropped below 80% HP so far this run. One quick jog over to Celadon City though means it's time for the Rocket Hideout, since I figured it would be a little more fun if I wiped this and the Pokemon Tower off the map first before taking on Erika. I will give this game credit where it's due though, the little segment where you control Pikachu to get the lift key is much more intelligible than, oh no, I dropped the lift key. The idea here is nearly identical to what was in the Pokemon Prism ROM hack made several years before, so I wonder if the devs got the idea from there, or if it was generated independently. Not that we'd ever get a straight answer, they'd condemn you to hell for speaking such a thing in front of them. Anyway, another battle with Jesse and James ensues, with Oddish getting kinda wailed on the entire time thanks to Arbok hitting Glare and Pikachu dying immediately. But I can't really complain since my HP and defense boosts along with recovery from Mega Drain makes this fight doable without looking at the screen, basically. Much less paying attention. Right after is... Oh. Hi Archer, I completely forgot you were retroactively added into this game from the Gen 2 remakes. Then again, I don't like Johto, so I made sure to kill his Pokemon with extra force, using Headbutt to get through them and get to Giovanni, who lost to Mega Drain one-shotting both Persian and Rhyhorn to win. Cool. Now for Erika, and since Oddish counts as a cute Pokemon, we're able to enter and kill her immediately with Acid. It's super effective on Tangela, one-shotting it, but then two-shotting Weepin' Bell and Vileplume as they do pitiful damage with Poison Jab and Moonblast respectively, putting us halfway done with our adventure. Back to Lavender we go, as it's an easy traversal up the Pokemon Tower for another Jesse and James fight, so in come Pikachu once again to die immediately, all while Oddish enters Burn from a previous Will-O-Wisp from one of the Ghost types. Now this might seem weird, but I'm doing this purposely to avoid the effects of Arbok's glare, which would make this fight take longer than needed. Anyway, Headbutt ends up doing the job quickly enough, with Oddish only hitting around 70% HP before both Arbok and Weezing go down, and let me get to the Poke Flute, opening the way to Fuchsia City, as well as Saffron thanks to Brock handing us the tea item. Though I think I can take on Silphco first, and then take on the Dual Gym level cap after, even at level 29. Yep, sure enough, even against Blue, we're able to two-shot an Executor with Acid through Light Screen, and Charizard kinda just dies after we use Growth and three Acids, though we do finally drop into the Yellow for the first time this run due to a burn. No problem though, I didn't feel threatened at all, so we're good. 
Once we hit the fifth floor though, we're good to grab the card key, though we have to take on a double battle against a Rocket Grunt and Executive Archer. So here comes a barrage of poison types that I can't hit worth a damn. Especially since Oddish learned Moonblast by level up, so I can't give headbutt to it without losing any of my integral moves. Though, I guess I could have gotten rid of Mega Drain since that's a TM from Erica, so I guess I wasn't just paying attention. Granted, I haven't been paying attention to any of this run, to be completely fair, so that's not surprising. No rival battle is needed here, instead Trace the Poopy Head decides to heal us for another fight against Jesse and James, who for some reason refuse to kill Pikachu, managing to survive the whole fight spamming Tail Whip, all while Oddish uses only special moves so it doesn't affect the outcome, winning me the fight quickly before the final challenge in Giovanni awaits. And by challenge, I mean pushover that owes me money. Mega Drain downs the whole battle, leaving me with just the next three gyms in a back-to-back -back fashion. First, we gotta head down to Fuchsia City, so after getting the Snorlax out of the way, we're able to get the last few required secret technique HM replacement moves before facing off against Koga. And in case you're wondering how we got past the 50 Pokemon needed to get to the gym, don't worry about it. I'm not using anything but Oddish anyway. Even at this point in the game though, nothing really hurts Oddish, making it so that it can spam growth all while his lead wheezing uses Explosion to barely do any damage, allowing me to continue to set up on Golbat. He's got Protect and Fly, which effectively are stall tools for me to take less damage while setting up more growths, KOing it in two Mega Drains before Venomoth enters third. It ends up going down pretty swiftly as well due to Growth finally being able to max out my attack stats while he wastes time with Protect, two-shotting it before Muck comes out last and goes down to a single Mega Drain. Well, if that doesn't prove my point of growth, just allowing me to brute force my way through these fights despite my power advantage decreasing by the level, I don't know what will. Speaking of advantage though, it's time for Sabrina, and while I don't have the advantage super effectively, I do by being able to actually hit her Pokemon for neutral damage. Though admittedly, I still set up growth against Mr. Mind to outlast Light Screen, letting her take me down to half HP with Psychic, while getting five uses of growth up, then sweeping with Mega Drain to KO Mr. Mime, Jinx, Slowbro, and Alakazam all in one shot each. Perfect, now to head to Cinnabar for Blaine. Thankfully, the Pokemon Mansion actually contains the TM for Sludge Bomb, so Oddish can finally have some semblance of attack power since we've really been lacking on the stab typings, thanks to Mega Drain and Acid only being 40 power. Unfortunately, we won't be getting an upgrade to Mega Drain though, as Giga Drain doesn't seem to exist in this game, and I don't think it would be wise wasting every other turn charging Solar Beam since that TM is available in Victory Road, and I think the Elite Four are going to be hitting hard enough to where that's not viable. Anyway, Blaine's probably the toughest opponent we've had to face yet, since he can finally dish out some real damage, and not let me get off as many growths as I would like before getting to his later Pokémon. His lead Magmar also has Confuse Ray, which has a byproduct of making Oddish hit itself for more and more damage due to also increasing its attack power with growth. Though that doesn't seem to be much of a problem when I can just clear it with a neutral unboosted Sludge Bomb to one-shot and get to Rapidash first. Now we can do some setup, as Fire Blast does less than a quarter and he's only got 5 power points before running out of options. So one growth is all I figured I'd set up, taking that single Fire Blast before dishing out 3 Sludge Bombs to KO Rapidash, Arcanine, and Ninetales in sequence to win the penultimate badge. Viridian City's gym takes like 3 minutes to open up because of some stupid text bubbles and people getting in my way, but it doesn't seem to matter as once I do get in there, it's 2 growths and a sweep with Mega Drain, KOing Doug Trio, Nidoking, Rhydon, and Nidoqueen Queen all with one shots to win the fight. But that's not the end of his suffering, as after a humiliating loss, he doesn't give me enough money to pay off his debts. So I have my hordes of Oddish melt him with acid before he makes it outside. That's what you get for messing with someone jacked up on sugar candy. Anyway, Trace the Poopy Head is right outside on Route 22 though, questioning where Giovanni went as I say nothing. Only bringing in Oddish to set up several growths and run through Pidgeot with Sludge Bomb, Marowak with Mega Drain, and Jolteon and Vileplume both with Sludge Bomb to finish the fight as he runs off before any more questions can be asked. Thankfully, the Victory Road puzzle remains rather unchanged, so it's a simple few battles with my perked up Oddish, getting through end of the level cap of 55 before entering the Elite Four. Pretty much completely bare, other than for some full restores for after each of the Elite Four battles. First up is Lorelei, and as expected, as a majority of her team revolves around water types, it's an easy setup with growth and sweep. Though, admittedly, I do end up using Moonblast here to KO everything, using two to take out Dugong and Jinx in one shot each, 
leading to Lapras, who manages to survive one and land an Ice Beam that manages to freeze Oddish. Now, this would be a disaster if it weren't for the also broken affection mechanic to thaw Oddish out immediately, letting me follow up with a second Moonblast to KO, leaving just Cloyster and Slowbro to go down to one Moonblast each to win the fight. Yeah, affection is broken. This is why we don't touch Pokemon Ami or Pokemon Refresh in Gen 6 or 7, respectively, because it breaks the game. Bruno's up second, and that lead Onyx is perfect for letting me set up, as despite Earthquake being a strong stab neutral attack, Oddish soaks them up for breakfast. Not that it matters, as Moonblast is also super effective against fighting types, so one growth is all I need to one-shot Onyx with Mega Drain, Hitmonchan and Machamp with Moonblast, Polyrath with Mega Drain, and finally Hitmonlee with another Moonblast to win the fight. Now, with Agatha, I do have to deal with the frustrating reality that is her lead Arbox Glare. I figured that I would just set up all six growths here, since I have literally nothing that's even neutrally effective against her Pokemon, so I just set up all of those and start blasting, being barraged with a few poison jabs before maxing out and hitting Mega Drain for a one-shot leading to Golbat. We're still at nearly full HP despite Air Slash making us flinch once, so Moonblast is the go-to here to get the one-shot, leading to the affection mechanic shaking off paralysis as our first Gengar hits the field. Now, unfortunately for me, Sludge Bomb isn't quite a one-shot, so Oddish is hit with Will-O-Wisp on the follow-up, leading to a likely full restore turn here. Oddly enough, though, she doesn't, just letting Gengar fall to a Moonblast as the rest of her team croaks as well. Mega Drain for Weezing and Moonblast for Gengar number two seals the deal and leads to the final Elite Four battle against Lance. He should be easy enough as his lead Seedra won't use her stab attack due to my resistance, so I'm able to get her to use Hyper Beam, getting two growths off because of the recovery turn, then hitting Seedra and Aerodactyl with Mega Drain one each, Gyarados and Charizard with Sludge Bomb, and finally Dragonite with Moonblast to KO all of them in one shot to win. One Max Elixir later, and the Poopy Head is here to challenge us one final time, or rather defend his title since we let the child get ahead of us out of fear for his life due to our lack of answers about Giovanni. He leads with Pidgeot and goes straight for the potential killing a blow by Mega Evolving. Yeah, I kind of forgot that this mechanic was here, but he does so and goes for Air Slash as I go for Sludge Bomb, hitting him down to the red and forcing a full restore as I get the one and only growth off that I need to just tear through this fight. Sludge Bomb from this point is a one-shot on Mega Pidgeot and Rapidash, leading to Slowbro to get my HP back with Mega Drain, followed up by Marowak falling to the same fate. This leaves just Vileplume and Jolteon to be rained down upon by Sludge Bomb, one-shotting each and giving me the title of champion, proving that you can indeed hardcore Nuzlocke Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu with only a single Oddish. Huh, it's uh, been a while since I've done a solo Pokemon run that wasn't with a Legendary, and it's hilarious that that actually worked. Figured it would be a pipe dream that I was going to have to catch some other Pokemon. But now that I've realized just how stupidly broken candies are, as well as the affection mechanic in tandem, I can't really say that this is in the spirit of the franchise Nuzlocke challenge. I'm probably not going to be able to make it below 493 Pokemon used by the end of Legends Arceus, unless I do the same thing with Let's Go Eevee and Bellsprout. And that just doesn't sound very entertaining from a viewer's perspective. So how about we have another go and run this game with zero non-rare candies being used. Wipe the slate clean, we're gonna redo Let's Go Pikachu for hopefully some semblance of a challenge. All right, back to Route 1 we go. Oddish is caught once again, and this time we're not chaining shit. Instead, I'm fighting Trace back in the lab, KOing his Eevee with Oddish's Barrage of Absorb before hitting Viridian Forest, and capturing a Pokemon that I've used the evolutions of, but not necessarily the base form, and that's Weedle. Back in my Leaf Green run, I ended up capturing Kakuna instead of Weedle, missing out on Poison Sting back then, but here, I at least get a second Pokemon in case things get out of hand or if I need to slow an opponent down before trying to KO it with Oddish. It's not going to be useful for very long at all, but it might prove to be a good sack for a safe switch later on in the run. A few required trainers later, and we're good to fight Brock for real this time. Though admittedly, just like the candy run, Oddish just clears this with quad effective stab absorb, hitting for Geodude and Onyx's pitiful special defense, KOing both in one shot each to win the fight, even at level 10. I figured I didn't want to go too far up on levels since the cap for Misty is 19, though this is probably an unnecessary precaution. 
Into Mount Moon we go, as it's time to search for our third encounter in Onyx. I figured I'm not going to get much use out of this thing in any other games, and Onyx seems like a pretty strong Pokemon to be using early on here. Though it was pretty tempting to go after either Clefable or Chansey when they popped up before Onyx did. However, I'm going to save those for Let's Go Eevee. I feel like they're going to be much more useful there. Heck, maybe even save Clefable for Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl, since those games could use some more encounters as to not be too limited. Before getting into the first Jesse and James fight though, I made sure to grab the Helix Fossil. Not just so that you wouldn't ask what fossil I got in the comments, but because I'm planning on resurrecting it later as my Cinnabar Island encounter. Also, thanks to Weedle and Onyx being part of our team, I can actually fight Jesse and James without a filler Pokemon this time around, going with Onyx and Oddish against Coughing and Ekans, targeting Coughing down with Rap and double targeting with Acid as I continue to whittle away, eventually KOing as Onyx was down to just around a quarter of his HP thanks to Poison. Of course, I'm under Rap though, so Onyx is in pretty deep shit here. I attack once more with both of them, using Rap and Acid once again before hitting just one HP, and thankfully being let go from Rap, allowing for a swap into Weedle and the cleanup duty to be performed by Oddish, KOing and winning the battle with a very close call. I guess it doesn't matter if Onyx is bulky if they can poison it. Escaping with our lives into Cerulean City, I'm at an appropriate level to take on Trace at level 14, leading with Onyx against Pidgey for the type matchup. Not a good start though, as Sand Attack lands before Onyx can go, but we do smack the bird with Rock Throw for a one-shot KO as Oddish comes out, so who cares? I may as well swap out of this Accuracy Deprivation because we're quad weak to absorb, and that goes into the quad resistant Weedle, taking three damage and using Poison Sting a few times, before getting its HP down by about 25% before Weedle's too weak to continue. Told you this bug would fall off pretty quickly. However, we can swap into our own Oddish, take Acid and Fire back with two of our own to KO before a potion brings Oddish back to full HP. So I guess there's uh, there's not just two, not good at all for me, but thankfully my Oddish busts out a critical Acid, hitting two more and surviving on seven HP to KO and leave just Eevee, a normal type without a good offensive move against a full HP Onyx. All I have to do is swap him in, take a quick attack and a few weak double kicks before a barrage of rap and tooth rock throws manages to seal the deal, winning the match once again with pretty low HP on all of my Pokemon. Not really pleased with this since we're really just revealing that this is not good enough to be continuing the game with. Thankfully though, after clearing out Nugget Bridge without too much of a threat against our Pokemon, well, aside from a Psyduck that pulls Onyx down to 1 HP so soon after the 1 HP brush with death earlier, we're finally able to enter the grass on Route 25 and capture my fourth encounter in Venonat. Now, I'm gonna need to keep this alive for the rest of the run, as Venomoth is integral to my strategy against the Elite Four. What is that strategy, you may ask? Setup sweeps. It's always setup sweeps. I mean, Venomoth has access to Quiver Dance. What more do I need to say? The rest of the gauntlet goes just fine as the SS tickets are secured, and I'm good to take on Misty's gym with Oddish, basically soloing here as the lead Psyduck hits Confusion for less than half as I go for growth, bringing us pretty low on the next attack as Absorb gets the one-shot and manages to recover enough HP to make us safe into Starmie as this thing doesn't have a super effective Psychic-type attack, with the only one it having being Psywave, which sucks balls. God, this move is terrible. Why did they not just give it confusion? Anyway, I do manage to just resist the Scald as well. So the only move it's going for is Swift at 60 power. And yeah, that's not doing that much as Absorb does over half damage, KOing following a second Swift to take the second badge once again. Good stuff, especially with the Dig TM coming up just afterwards, giving me a perfect move to take care of Lieutenant Surge with. Though, of course, I'm gonna need to take out Trace on the SSN first, evolving Oddish into Gloom beforehand to give me just a little bit more of an edge, delaying to level 22 so that I would have early access to Mega Drain for this fight. I also tried to get Vileplume beforehand, because there's the path from Diglett's Cave to Route 2, which Route 2 has a Leaf Stone, but that path is blocked for now. Not a problem, I should have enough artillery in the party to push through at this point. He leads off with Pidgeotto as I go with Onyx. Shocking, right? Well, Sand Attack hits twice, but we still hit two rock throws through it to KO and lead it to Oddish. So it's time for the same strategy we used during the last fight. Swap in a Weedle, take whatever attacks it decides to throw at us while dealing out pitiful poison stings because dear god this thing is literally useless. However, now he's got Sleep Powder in his arsenal, slowing down Weedle's little potential progress even more, leaving it at nearly full HP once Weedle is too low and needs to be swapped out for Gloom. However, Gloom cleans it up even through a Super Potion really easily thanks to Acid. 
surviving at around 50% HP as Eevee comes in, and back into Onyx we go, despite double kicks since Dig is just so strong of a move for this point in the game, two-shotting it and KOing to win. One chop down later, and we're ready for Surge's gym. Now thankfully, Onyx just makes this a cakewalk with the Electric-type immunity and access to Dig, one-shotting Voltorb following a Light Swift, leading to Raichu. And it's double kick twice for some pretty impressive damage, getting us down to around 20% before KOing with the second dig, leaving just Magnemite. Now I know this thing has Sonic Boom and we're below 20 HP, but I'm faster so it doesn't matter, KOing with one quad effective dig and winning me the fight single handedly. But before I can head through Rock Tunnel, I've got to grab that Leaf Stone on Route 2 to evolve Gloom into Vile Plume, as well as grab our Route 11 encounter in Mr. Mime. This one's another important Pokemon for me, especially since it's one of the few fairy types I have access to in Kanto, as well as one of the few psychic types remaining, as the only other one I can think of off the top of my head is Hypno. The only problem with that, though, is because there's so much poison around in this region, it makes it very risky to bring into battle without knowledge in advance on whether I can outspeed everything and hit a powerful Psychic-type attack before the opponent has a chance to do anything about it. And with a minus speed nature, that's not really helping much. But hey, we're at least near a full party. In fact, with our encounter in Rock Tunnel being Kangaskhan, we are at a full party. Good thing I didn't end up using this in any of the Alola games, since it's coming up pretty well as a normal type tank all while I reserve Snorlax, either for Let's Go Eevee or if I can get away with it, either Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl because of Honey Trees and oh god I'm gonna have to deal with those again. Anyway, exiting out of Rock Tunnel, I figured I would avoid Pokemon Tower for now to head into Celadon City and open up the entrance to Saffron to get the TM for Psychic, since it's pretty relevant with both Venonat and Mr. Mime, heading on back for the rival fight in the tower. He leads off with Pidgeotto as I go with Mr. Mime, outspeeding and nailing Thunderbolt thanks to that TM that we got from Lieutenant Surge to get him down into the red as a wing attack lands for around a third. This basically puts him in a heal lock, so we're outspeeding, KOing with two more, and leading to Gloom. I figured I'd see if I could get the one-shot here with Psychic since it's likely going for Sleep Powder, since for some reason Pokemon AI really loves status effects and prioritizing them over super effective moves, but sadly we just barely miss what's likely a good range to KO as Sleep Powder connects. Further, you know, emphasizing that the fact that ranges are just the bane of my existence and I'm not allowed to ever hit them. Anyway, meaning it's time we are likely to see a poison move next turn, so it's time to mitigate some damage with Kangaskhan, swapping into a very light acid as Fake Out is able to secure the KO, leaving just Jolteon. Now, I figured I could get some good damage in with Bite, though with Jolteon outspeeding and hitting Thundershock turn after turn, we're only able to hit three of them and get him to a quarter of his HP before entering crit range. So I swap into Onyx for the Electric Immunity, taking a pinned missile on the crackback before Dig is able to be used, connecting next turn for the rather easy win. I can't complain with the results there. Seems like everything went smoothly now that we're finally using some rather capable Pokemon in battle like Vileplume, Kangaskhan, and Mr. Mime. We're even closing in on the evolution level for Venonat, so we should be rocking a really solid team once we get there. For now though, rocket hideout time, and for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna skip over the Jesse and James as well as Archer fights in these games, since they are just goons, and if I'm losing Pokemon to them, then I'll bring it up so that you can point and laugh at me down in the comments for being a dumb, stupid, idiot moron. Anyway, Giovanni's a pretty simple fight, with his lead Persian being pretty simple to deal with thanks to Onyx and a combo of Rock Slide and Dig, taking slashes like there's no tomorrow, and KOing with around 40% HP remaining. Next out is Rhyhorn, so I swap into Kangaskhan to see what move he would go for, and uh, yeah, that's expected, it's Drill Run. Not like something I would have expected to be in Let's Go, to be completely honest, but that is a fitting move for Rhyhorn. Anyway, Fake Out and Dig are able to connect for nearly half damage before I bring in Bileplume, taking nearly half from Drill Run, but outspeeding to KO with Mega Drain on the follow-up to win the fight. Probably should have just done that from the get-go, but I didn't want to be left wondering what move he was going to choose there, even though it was kind of obvious considering the other moves were Rock Slide, Mega Horn, and Horn Attack. Though admittedly, that I only knew because I decided to look it up after the fight, because I'm only half paying attention now that I'm actually using multiple Pokemon without massive stat boosts. Anyway, Erika is now primed for the beating as she leads Tangela against my Kangaskhan, using Fake Out for some decent damage before starting on the offensive with Bite, flinching before hitting a Dizzy Punch that doesn't get the confusion, unfortunately meaning that Tangela is able to hit a Sleep Powder before going for Mega Drain, and I don't think I want Kangaskhan to be losing HP a ton while Tangela recovers a boatload because of it. So I swap in a Weedle for the resistance, taking two of them and only hitting a single Poison Sting before Sleep Powder comes to ruin my day again. 
All good though is now it can swap into Venomoth and finally put an end to this battle of attrition with Leech Life, KOing and leading to her own Vileplume. Venomoth manages to outspeed and nail a Psychic for just over half as Vileplume decides to shift over to using Moonblast, barely doing any damage to me so I figured why not, let's just use Leech Life to make sure I'm at full HP going into Weepin' Bell. Well, that's what you would call a dumb, stupid, idiot moron plan, as it barely does any damage and I end up taking more net damage from the second Moonblast than if I had just KO'd with Psychic. I at least fix the mistake next turn, removing Vileplume from this plane of existence and forcing Weepin' Bell to come in last. Now, while Psychic nearly KOs, this time it does way more than it does to Vileplume, so this should be the perfect range following a Poison Jab to KO with Leech Life. It ends up working perfectly as Weepin' Bell falls and we're conferred with the Rainbow Badge. Before I head back into Lavender Town, I'm gonna grab some TMs that are floating around. Protect, Reflect, and Light Screen are all above the Celadon City Mart, as well as a few various TMs in one of the shops themselves, along with Helping Hand, I guess? I mean, it's literally only good in the Jesse and James fights, there's no other double battles here. Not sure why they put the move into the game just for that, but I guess. Protect is the main move we're looking for here, though, since Onyx has Earthquake, and I don't have a flying type, so hopefully it'll do. Back to Lavender we go for the Pokemon Tower, and it's a quick Jesse and James fight that goes about how you'd expect with Pokemon that resist poison types while also knowing psychic and ground type moves. A critical earthquake takes out Arbok as Venomoth has gone for protect earlier, Weezing and Arbok both targeting it, so no damage on my end, allowing me to just psychic and KO Weezing on the next turn for a no damage encounter. Perfect. All right, now to get that Poke Flute and make our way down to Fuchsia City to grab the final secret techniques to make Kanto fully explorable. Though I do capture the Snorlax on Route 16 just in case I need it. Probably won't, but still I'd rather not waste one of the only two in the game than if I can get away with it. I did accidentally run into a trainer on Route 17 though that was several levels above me. Thankfully though, it didn't end up being much of a problem thanks to having super effective attacks for Executor, Ninetales, and Starmie, but that did stress me out seeing Pokemon in their 40s while I'm still rocking like level 36 to 37 mons. But with Fuchsia City Flyable, we're good to enter Sylph Company and take on a few boss battles there. First up is Blue, leading Executor against my Venomoth, who I figure is just going to one-shot with Leech Life, but of course it ends up being just shy, despite being quad effective, and taking a Psychic that nearly one-shots if it weren't for the affection mechanic saving my ass from the brink. The second one takes it out, leaving just Charizard, so we swap out for Onyx, dodge an attack, then take a Heat Wave for about half as Rock Slide KOs for quad effective damage once again to win the fight. Huh, eh, maybe should have gone up to level 40 to avoid that catastrophe. Well, one annoying Archer and Grunt double battle later because dear f***ing god, this muck would not f***ing die because that damn minimize, it is, I must have been there for, what, like 10, 15 minutes almost of in real time, which is absolutely the most annoying thing I've ever had to do in a Pokemon game in my entire life. It just wouldn't stop. I couldn't kill it. It kept using Toxic, and being Toxic, and using Protect, and just ensuring that I wouldn't be able to kill it. I mean, if I didn't have a few poison types, like Weedle, Vileplume, and Venomoth on hand, this probably could have been a complete disaster and potential wipe to the stacking threat of Toxic Poison. Anyway, we did get past it with no deaths, and Jesse and James are once again here to impede my progress. But that's no problem again thanks to Venomoth and Onyx. Once again, using Protect on the former and blocking both Glare and Flamethrower as Onyx does massive damage with Arbok and a little under half to Weezing with Earthquake. This leads me to follow up with Psychic from Venomoth on Weezing to KO, and after Glare lands on Venomoth following that Psychic, Rock Slide's able to finish off the large snack to win the fight. Now for the actual hard part, Giovanni. I still don't have a water type for these damn ground types, nor will I have one that's not actually weak to ground, thanks to Ammonite also being part rock type, so I still have to trek through this one carefully. At first, it's a battle of normal types, Kangaskhan versus Persian, but with the power of Dizzy Punch and no slash crits, we manage to outlast with around half HP as Persian goes down and Rhyhorn takes its place. Going for Drill Run as we swap into Vileplume, ticking a little under half, and using Mega Drain to KO and refill my HP to full. 
Last up is Nitto Queen, and honestly, I think I can cheese the rest of this fight if this works. May as well go for it. Body Slam lands, doesn't paralyze, and I land the 75% Sleep Powder, allowing for me to just start going for Mega Drain for neutral damage following a single growth, which gives me a two-shot KO all while Nitto Queen stays asleep. Well, I guess that wasn't that hard, but I would have appreciated a water type right about now. Too bad, basically all of Kanto's water types that I have left are basically EV exclusives or fossils at this point. But with Stealth Company taken down, it's time for the rest of the gyms in rapid fire succession within eight levels of each other, because who cares about pacing when we can shove the player into fights for fun? Starting with Koga, since I have a much better advantage over him than I do with Sabrina, with my whopping three poison types, he leads off with Weezing and myself with Kangaskhan, hitting Fake Out and Dig as he wastes a turn with Protect, thankfully not blocking my Dig as he outspeeds and fails to land anything, then doesn't outspeed next turn as I go for Dig again and Dodge Explosion. What a blumbering idiot. Anyway, Muck comes out right after and has the sense to use Protect on my second turn of, uh, the dig, you know, the move that you're supposed to protect the second turn against. So I start going for Dizzy Punch for around a third right after, only to get hit with a Sludge Bomb that instantly poisons Kangaskhan as I try to go for another attack, only to be stalled by Protect. Thankfully, we still have a fully healed Onyx in the back. Uh, turns out it's not actually fully healed because I forgot to restore the... Earthquake power points. Okay, well, that's fine, that's fine. We can bait Toxic so I can swap into Venomoth for free as well. Baited and totally intentional, I swear to God. Anyway, we're able to bring in Venomoth on that Toxic, which does nothing, and we're in an advantageous position, so I can just start using Psychic to wail on the garbage creature, with him just trying to survive thanks to Protect, but two Psychics is all she wrote when Sludge Bomb barely does any damage leading to Golbat. Now, thankfully, I'm not out of Rock Slide power points, so I swap in as he uses Fly, doing around 75% as he lands before getting stalled with Protect for a turn, only to be hit by Leech Life and miss, but that's fine since it's not restoring nearly enough for it to not die to a second one, leaving just Venomoth. I'm expecting a Psychic here, and I'm correct, so I get to go into Mr. Mime to resist and set up a light screen, allowing myself to survive any attacks that he throws at me, finally ending on a Psychic that gets a one-shot to KO and win the fight. Can't say that was really bad execution of a fight. It definitely seems like I'm not paying attention and just throwing shit at the wall only to see what sticks. But hey, what's the likelihood of that coming back to bite me at this exact point in Let's Go Eevee? Surely it's low, so I don't care. On to Sabrina. Before I go in there though, I made sure to head to Cinnabar Island to grab the TM for Sludge Bomb down in the Pokemon Mansion. Seemed pretty important for both Vileplume and Venomoth after all, I am going to need all the artillery I can get for this battle. Other than that though, I really don't have anything else to bring into this fight for an advantage, so we're just gonna have to wing it and see if I can pull off an upset with some poison types. We both start out with our respective Mr. Mimes, with myself using Shadow Ball turn 1, since I outspeed, hitting before Light Screen can be established by Sabrina, but then setting up my own on turn 2 to ensure that she never does enough damage with her only offensive move on Mr. Mime, Psychic. I, however, have the super effective move, so I'm completely fine just staying in here and barely taking any damage, hitting two Shadow Balls and two Thunderbolts to outlast the Light Screen, outspeeding and hitting a third to KO as Light Screen fades and leads to Alakazam. Now, Alakazam only has two attacks, Psychic and Nightshade, which it hits the latter as I go for another Light Screen to reapply it for other Pokemon. I'm anticipating another Nightshade here, so I swap to Kangaskhan, only to be hit by a critical Psychic. Well, at least that's enough for me to survive another non-crit Psychic while under Light Screen. So Fake Out and Crunch are enough for me to KO, but that's enough damage for Kangaskhan to be incapacitated for the rest of this fight. I don't have a clean swap over to anything as Slowbro enters the field, so I just use Crunch as I can survive another Surfer Psychic as long as they don't crit, and that just so happens to happen. But then, I really don't do enough for me to consider raw swapping into anything to take either attack. So, Weedle... It's finally time, buddy. Your purpose has been fulfilled. Thank you for dying to Psychic. This gets me a clean swap into Vileplume with just enough damage on Slowbro to hit Mega Drain and KO, as he has not yet set up a light screen, leaving just Jinx. Well, the ice typing is a little bit of a problem, but as we all know, Pokemon AI loves to prioritize status moves. In this case, Lovely Kiss. So I'm gonna try outspeeding and hitting Sleep Powder for a clean swap, but I don't outspeed. Instead, Vileplume dodges Lovely Kiss, and I'm able to hit that Sleep Powder. 
From here, though, I think I can just get away with swinging with a few sludge bombs, and sure enough, that's a clean two-shot KO as Jinx stays asleep for the two turns, giving me yet another win. Not bad, but I'm definitely going to need some more type advantages over Blaine if I want a chance of winning. Onyx is not going to cut it. Firstly, I can grab Ammonite on Cinnabar Island and evolve it into Amistar without the pre-evolution getting the chance to see battle even once, only increasing our total used count by one. Then over in the Seafoam Islands, there's actually a water type I haven't used before, that being Seal. So the same thing goes for Seal here, it doesn't even make it into battle before evolving into Dugong. Now this should be enough for Blaine, though the neutrality to fire with Dugong isn't necessarily where I want to be, but again, it should be good enough. Blaine leads Magmar and myself with Mr. Mime, surprisingly. See, Magmar has Confuse Ray, so I want to make sure I take this thing out early without much of a problem. First things first, I want to set up dual screens with Mr. Mime, dodging Confuse Ray on turn 1 and outspeeding turn 2 to get up Light Screen and Reflect, swapping Amistar into a quad-resisted flamethrower. But of course, he outspeeds next turn and hits Confuse Ray, only to die to Scald right afterwards as Amistar doesn't hit itself. Next out is Arcanine, and thankfully because we're in on a Pokemon that quad resists fire, he goes for Outrage as I swap into Dugong, absorbing it pretty well as I go for Waterfall for pretty decent damage, but once Outrage ends next turn and Fatigue sets in, I figure it's a wise time to swap into Mr. Mime to set up another Reflect, thankfully getting it up before a Flare Blitz does around two thirds, but Arcanine finally succumbs to a Psychic right after as Rapidash takes the field third. I think at this point it's practically over though, as Rapidash nor Ninetales have anything but fire or normal moves, plus no status moves, so I can just bring in Amistar, hit Hydro Bump to KO Rapidash, then barely miss the KO on Ninetales because it's an asshole and insists on being scalded to death. I comply with this request and earn the Volcano Badge in the process, leaving just Giovanni. Now with two water types, a grass type, a psychic type, and a bug poison type that also know psychic, I should be in really great hands here. Giovanni leads Doug Trio as I go with Kangaskhan, hitting Fake Out for massive damage as Dizzy Punch follows up to nearly KO, taking an Earthquake for around 45% as a second Dizzy Punch KOs and leading to Nidoking. So we gotta get the heck out of dodge on this one. Out comes Dugong on my side as Earthquake does around 40%, so I should be able to hit at least one Waterfall before having to swap again, which does less than half. Surely this should be enough for Vileplume to clean up following taking two Earthquakes to nearly go down, but Mega Drain does finish this off as it's neutral thanks to that ground typing, and gets Vileplume back up to nearly half HP before Rhydon comes out third. Well, I was definitely expecting the Nitto Queen to come out third, but I will 100% take the easy one-shot and getting back up to full HP as Nitto Queen comes out last. Thankfully here, Earthquake does a whole lot less due to Nidoqueen's Queen's attack power being a lot lower than Nidoking, King, so that allows for Vileplume to just survive three of them and fire back with three Mega Drains to KO and win me the final badge and the TM for Earthquake. Unfortunately, I already have that on Onyx though, so it's not that big of a deal. But even more unfortunately is that Onyx is dead because a Gym Trainer's Nidoking King managed to hit an Earthquake and KO it. That is a literal base 160 defense. I figured it would be safe, but nope. Uh, I wasn't exactly planning on bringing it into the league, though, so that's not that much of a problem. I just would have appreciated it for the rival battle on Route 22, though. Trace leads with Pidgeot, so I go with Kangaskhan, using Fake Out to get that chip damage and guaranteed flinch before getting hit with Sand Attack on turn 2. Thankfully not missing Dizzy Punch, not once but twice as he goes for Roost next turn, hitting himself in confusion as a third connects, but unfortunately that's where the apple falls off of the tree, as two Dizzy Punches manages to miss in a row as Pidgeot heals up to full with two Roosts, hitting itself in confusion next turn as Dizzy Punch connects once more, but after the second Sand Attack leads into another Dizzy Punch miss, I opt to swap into Amistar and a Roost so that I could actually hit the damn thing. From here, I kind of get frustrated on an Air Slash, so I go for Hydro Pump in the effort to out-damage the healing from Roost, but after hitting two of them, I don't really want to test my luck. So I start going for Scald to try to get the burn to outlast Roost that way, finally managing to burn but not KO it before he swaps for Vileplume. Thankfully though, because I used Scald again this turn, it hits Vileplume and manages to burn it on the first connection. This should be enough residual damage for me to swap into my own Vileplume once he locks himself into Petal Dance, taking minimal damage as I go for Mega Drain despite the fact that it's quad resisted, to try to keep my HP up as much as possible. But he takes the memo and goes back out to Pidgeot, only to die to a resisted Mega Drain from already being in low red HP. 
One down, three to go as Marowak enters next. I don't know why you would do that when this thing is so goddamn slow. So thanks for the free KO and the free HP. Down that goes as Jolteon comes in next, which outspeeds, but with Thunder being the move of choice, it tends to miss and does so here, allowing for a one-shot with Sludge Bomb, leaving his own pre-damaged Vileplume to fall to the same fate to win the fight. I guess screw Onyx, I don't really need one of those if I'm just gonna kill him with the other members of my team. One victory road later though, and we're about ready for the league. I do need to do some preparations first. First up, I don't want to bring Dugong into the league, it's just too weak, the base stats are not up to par, and I think Amistar handles the water type role rather well. So I opt to head to the power plant to capture myself a Magnemite. Now if you recall, I did already capture one of these in Alpha Sapphire, but I never ended up using it nor Magneton, only opting to use Magnezone as that Pokemon is not available here. Magneton having the extremely advantageous steel typing certainly should come in handy against Agatha, especially because it's not available on any other Pokemon in this game aside from transferring in a Meltan or Melmetal from Pokemon Go, which we can't do, and the electric typing for Lorelei and Lance, as well as Pidgeot and Slowbro on Trace's team, gives me quite a bit of coverage for only capturing a single new Pokemon. Lastly, TMs are all scattered across the region and I want a good number of them. Stuff like Rock Slide, Thunder Punch, Poison Jab, Roost, X Scissor, Dazzling Gleam, Play Rough, Fire Punch, Surf, Flash Cannon, Dragon Pulse, Flamethrower, Ice Beam, Drill Run, Outrage, literally just picking up everything I can, despite not all of these being usable. I figured I'd just pick up everything since I was worried about forgetting something and losing because of it. But with Kangaskhan, Vileplume, Amistar, Mr. Mime, Venomoth, and Magneton in the party, I'm ready for the Elite Four. First up, Lorelei starts with Dugong and myself with Mr. Mime, using Reflect and swapping for Venomoth so I can start setting up Quiver Dance, while protected relatively well from the three physical attacks that Dugong is packing. I've also got Roost on the moveset so I can just out-heal whatever she throws at me, even critical hits post-reflect, so this is an easy setup. Getting up six Quiver Dances and one-shotting Dugong, Jinx and Slowbro with Bug Buzz, then Cloyster and Lapras with Sludge Bomb to win immediately. Bruno's basically the same. Instead, though, I opt for Vileplume, setting up a bit of growth just to get my special attack high enough to basically one or two shot whatever I can with Mega Drain or Dazzling Gleam, having to replace Sludge Bomb for super effective damage. This works perfectly as Onyx ends up falling to Mega Drain, Hitmonchan to Dazzling Gleam, Machamp to two Giga Drains following an Earthquake, Polyrath to Mega Drain, and Hitmonlee to Dazzling Gleam for the quick sweep. Third on the lineup is Agatha, and with Arbok having Glare, I can't really be sitting here waiting to set up on it, so instead I opt for Kangaskhan leading here to try to KO it before Glare can ever be an issue for the team. Fake Out does pretty decent damage, making me decently confident that Earthquake will KO, but of course it's a range and I barely miss it, getting hit with a Poison Jab for about a quarter damage as Earthquake finishes it off next turn, leading to Gengar. While I feel like I can definitely survive whatever it throws at me, even Will-O-Wisp should be fine since Gengar is physically weak, using that and going down to two Earthquakes regardless following a Sludge Bomb. Third out is Weezing, and now I'm forced to swap out due to being too low of HP, taking a Sludge Bomb with my swapped in Vileplume and attempting to put it to sleep with Sleep Powder, but I miss my one and only opportunity after two Sludge Bombs does too much damage, so I'm swapped into Magneton next turn. Thankfully, the immunity to poison gives me that free swap, hitting Thunderbolt next turn for a little under half as Shadow Ball hits for around a third, leading to me getting the bright idea of swapping between Kangaskhan and Magneton for both Ghost and Poison immunity. Getting in Fake Out on every turn that Kangaskhan's out since that's just free damage, eventually going out to Venomoth once I'm satisfied enough with my handiwork to start setting up Quiver Dance. Unfortunately, the other move that Weezing has is Thunderbolt, so I am at risk of being paralyzed. Thankfully, the speed control of that is mitigated by Quiver Dance, but the 25% chance of being immobilized is a little worrisome. I've got Roost back on the moveset here so I can take such a beating, still not quite being paralyzed though by the time I get to plus 6 and max HP with Roost, so <laughs> the rest of the team falls to Psychic, taking out Weezing, Golbat, and Gengar number 2 to finish the fight. One more to go before the champion, and I still haven't lost a single Pokemon, so let's keep it that way. Lance leads Seedra because, oops, we didn't add a second Dragon type, and I go for Mr. Mime, using Protect to outlast Hydro Pump as I go for Light Screen next turn while outspeeding, taking a Hydro Pump during the same turn, but after the Light Screen's established. 
From here, it's an easy protect to block shot number three as Calm Mind is set up against the fourth. I'm not sweeping here, but I am doing this to set up for the special defense and protect blocks the fifth and final Hydro Bump, leaving him with only Hyper Beam as his offensive attack as Mr. Mime is part fairy and therefore immune to Dragon Pulse. Mr. Mime dodges the first Hyper Beam as Light Screen wears off with the second Calm Mind going up, so I let it elapse and use a second Light Screen being hit with Hyper Beam this turn. That's probably the most optimal thing that could have happened here, since now I can take that Recharge turn to bring in Venomoth for free, and we all know what's gonna go on here. Quiver Dance set up and sweet baby, just taking on the onslaught of Dragon Pulse and setting up while also making sure to use Roost at early times so that I avoid the potential of a critical hit ruining my day. Seedra also starts going for Hyper Beam once again, here right around when I get to plus 6, giving me a free turn to Roost back to full HP before outspeeding and KOing with Psychic. Aerodactyl comes out second and falls to the same fate, as does Gyarados to a probably unnecessary critical hit. Charizard dies fourth, and finally, out comes Dragonite. It has Fire Punch, so this better one-shot. But crazily enough, it does not. That is a strong Dragonite. That leaves him at only a sliver, though, as Outrage is used and connects, bringing Venomoth down. But thankfully, we outspeed thanks to the power of Quiver Dance, with one more Psychic doing him in and winning me the fight. Well, that was pretty good that Seedra used Hyper Beam on that last turn instead of Dragon Pulse, since if it didn't, I wouldn't be able to be at full HP, and Venomoth would have been toast, and I would have been down a very important Pokemon going into the champion fight. But with one more TM move swapping session and PowerPoint restoring later, I think I'm ready. He leads with Pidgeot as I go with Mr. Mime once more, seeing the Mega Evolution on turn one and hitting Quick Attack as I opt for Light Screen, taking a second as a critical to bring Mr. Mime into the yellow as I go for Thunder Wave, then swap for Venomoth. From here, it's Quiver Dance time since both Air Slash and Heat Wave are extremely threatening moves, but thankfully for me, two Paralysis turns in a row gives me enough time to set up three Quiver Dances before Light Screen wears off, doing enough for Venomoth to take less than half from Air Slash and recover thanks to Roost, all while finishing off the setup sweep with Quiver Dance. I probably would have been absolutely boned if a critical hit had come through during this time, but I did have a plan B and C for this fight just in case. But as it's a chaotic meatball tradition, I've got to go for the path of least thinking first. Usually, those paths I can't mess up. Only RNG can screw me over in those scenarios. Also, hilariously, by the end of this setup and using Roost to be as high of HP as possible, Pidgeot misses Air Slash, so I'm at full HP as Venomoth is finally able to start sweeping. Hitting Pidgeot with Psychic, Sludge Bomb KOs Rapidash, doing the same to Slow Row to put down half the team in three turns flat, with Marowak coming out and eating a Psychic for dinner and inducing a Carb Coma, leading to Jolteon. Once more, Sludge Bomb is a KO here, as is Psychic on Vileplume, winning the last battle of Let's Go Pikachu, with my Sweeper at completely full HP and no lost Pokemon during the league. Well, shoot, that was a really nice run, all things considered. Only two deaths, one being planned with Weedle, because there was no way that thing was ever going to be useful past, what, level 10? And the other just being out of incompetence with Onyx. But hey, a win's a win, and I've got to save a few Pokemon that I can use in Let's Go Eevee, or potentially one of the other seven remaining games down the line. Speaking of Eevee, though, let's jump right in and finish off Generation 7. Let's go Eevee's got pretty much the same start as Pikachu, as instead of getting Oddish on Route 1, we're getting Bellsprout. And while this might seem as just a big an advantage as Oddish was for the first two gyms of Pikachu, it's really not. The problem here is that Bellsprout's a physical attacker, and that makes Brock a really difficult obstacle to overcome, especially without any spare Pokemon. Man, maybe I should have saved Weedle to be sacked here. Geodude's out first though, nearly going down to a single Vine Whip, but managing to survive and get in a tackle for 7 damage, which isn't too much as it goes down to a second, leaving just Onyx. Now the main problem here is that if I get flinched by Headbutt even once, I'm probably dead. I just don't have another option. Thankfully, he goes for Rock Throw on turn 1, letting me hit a Vine Whip for over half, and while his second turn does lead into a Headbutt, I win the 90% chance and KO with a second Vine Whip to win the Boulder Badge. Alright, now we're home free for some new encounters. Mount Moon contains Clefairy, yet another fairy type that's relatively rare in this region, and evolves immediately into Clefable, since there's nothing I want by level up and the Moonstone just happened to be in the same room. Clefable's pretty damn strong for this early in the game as well, making the first encounter with Jesse and James rather simple thanks to headbutting coughing over and over again both with Bellsprout and Clefable, flinching it out before it could even have the chance to do anything, all while Ekans wastes time with very weak acids, eventually going down to the same fate. 
Just outside, Route 4 contains... Ekans? Hold up, did I accidentally swap the version exclusives and now I'm down a whole bunch of encounters? Ah, sh well, according to my notes and reflecting on Volbapedia, yes I did! Well, so much for Sandshrew, that would have at least been another Pokémon to use despite being terrible against Misty. Especially for this rival battle up on Nugget Bridge, though thankfully it goes rather smoothly. First up on Trace's team is Pidgey, so I go with Clefable to two-shot it with Headbutt while barely taking any damage, with Oddish coming out second and whiffing a Sleep Powder as I swap to Bellsprout for free. From here, it's just Headbutt Spam while he goes for Acid, hitting 4 to KO following a Potion, all while only taking 2 Acids for less than half damage total, leaving just Pikachu. Well, I'm still on my resistant Grass type, so I just go for 2 Headbutts, managing to hit through 2 double teams to KO and win the fight. I guess I don't need Sandshrew, team's doing just fine the way it is. Two SS tickets in the bag later, and we should be good to go for Misty now. She leads with Psyduck, so I go with Thunder Wave from Clefable to paralyze it, since we grabbed that on Route 25. Initially thinking of going for a Growth Sweep with Bellsprout, but thanks to Psyduck having Confusion, that's probably not the best idea. I opt to just go for three headbutts to KO it, all while taking around 40% damage total from Psyduck, leaving just Starmie. Now, without a psychic move that can do much damage, I go for Thunder Wave, all while taking Psy Wave, which apparently proves me wrong as it rolls extremely high. Who knew this attack had the potential to be good if you just get really lucky? Surely the base is for a great attack. Well, that's enough for Clefable. Out comes Bellsprout on a free switch thanks to Paralysis, and three Vine Whips are all that's needed to KO through a Psy Wave and Swift to win the fight. Two down, six to go. But I do need some more party members because two is really not going to be cutting it for the rest of the game. Firstly, Route 5 has the rare spawn of Chansey, and while I would have preferred not to use this since it's technically obtainable in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, at least it's easy enough to just obtain Hepini, max out its friendship while at that stage, evolve it into Chansey through the Oval Stone, then just use a single rare candy on it to get Blissey, bypassing the middle stage entirely, so I figured this is probably a safe option for this game. With three members in hand though, boy that sounds suggestive, the SSN rival fight becomes a lot more doable. He leads with Pidgeotto and myself with Chansey, using Thunder Wave as he stays paralyzed for two turns in a row, letting me get off a Growl and then go for another as he goes for Sand Attack. The goal here is just incapacitate Pidgeotto from being able to do damage with Wing Attack once I finally throw out Bellsprout to Sweep, who remains unevolved because I want it to learn Poison Jab at level 26 instead of waiting for 36 as a Weepin Bell, as I can just sweep by setting up a few growths and swap out a Sand Attack if the AI decides to be a butthole about it. This all ends up working out perfectly as both Chansey and Clefable have Growl, finishing that task and allowing Bellsprout to come in, set up two growths, and go for Headbutt, two-shotting Pidgeotto, one-shotting Oddish, then one-shotting Pikachu with Razor Leaf to win the fight. Awesome, and now with the Chopdown ability in hand, I'm good to go to Rock Tunnel. Yeah, we're actually heading out of our way here since there's one encounter that makes Lieutenant Surge trivial, that being Rhyhorn. While, yes, Clefable gets access to Dig, that doesn't make it a good physical attacker whatsoever, though Rhyhorn actually gets access to Drill Run by level up before Surge's cap, giving me an even more potent option thanks to its increased critical hit ratio. Right before the fight, though, we're good to evolve Bellsprout into Weepin' Bell upon learning Poison Jab, though we'll grab that Leaf Stone after the battle. First up, Voltorb against Rhyhorn. This is a simple one since Swift barely does any damage as Drill Run KOs, leading to Raichu who does massive damage with Double Kick, bringing Rhyhorn down into the red with two of them as Drill Run is a two-shot KO, barely just missing it on the first one. Betcha it's another range, gotta love those! <sighs> Last out is Magnemite, and with this thing having Sonic Boom, I'm not risking a damn thing, so I swap into Chansey to take it like it's like light breakfast because... This thing has a bunch of HP, and then I swap into Clefable to take the Thunderbolt before using Dig for the quad effective one-shot KO and victory. Perfect execution, albeit with a terrifying outcome if either of those double kicks had gotten a crit. Now, before heading to Lavender Town, I need two things beforehand. Firstly is the old Amber and Pewter City, which I think will be a much better Cinnabar Island encounter than Kabuto could ever be, especially due to Starmie being available in Let's Go Eevee, which is a much more superior water type. Plus, having a ground type immunity would be a godsend. Then, of course, the Leaf Stone on Route 2 to get me a victory bell. Now the team's really looking solid. One tunnel later, and we're in Lavender Town, but not quite Pokemon Tower, since I went ahead to Celadon to get those TMs that are available there ASAP. 
Not sure how many of these will be useful overall, but Iron Tail and Rhyhorn for coverage, then Tri-Attack and Shadow Ball for Clefable makes really solid differences for my team. Plus, we can go ahead and grab Psychic from Saffron City after talking to Brock, so that's even more for that poison type that I'm kind of susceptible to. If only we had Seismic Toss, though, for Chansey, since this thing can't really do much outside of Thunder Wave something and hope to god it KOs with, like, 10 Thunderbolts. Anyway, let's go ahead and go do that Pokemon Tower rival battle. He leads Pidgeotto as I go for Clefable, and you might be asking, why not Rhyhorn? Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt, that's why. Uh, next out is Gloom, which Psychic manages to two-shot with following a Mist Sleep Powder, leaving just Raichu, which I go for Dig for, getting it with Thunder Punch first, though, and that unfortunately paralyzes before I go underground. But Dig does manage to hit after one of Raichu's Mist Attacks, with Clefable expelling the paralysis because the affection mechanic has already started to be an annoying pest. Out to Rhyhorn we go, though, and Drill Run finishes the battle as expected. Rocket Game Corner time now, I suppose, and once you actually look at their levels, though, you kind of realize that it's wise to fight Erika before Giovanni, considering his Pokemon are level 35, with the cap currently being level 34, raised to 44 with Koga and Sabrina. But it's probably not anything to worry about. Persian and Rhyhorn are no match for this team. Persian matches up terribly against my own Rhyhorn, taking Fake Out and Slashes up the wazoo, all while I wail on Persian, firstly getting a crit with Drill Run that does just around half, while two more get the job done, taking just a little over half damage itself from the Fake Out and Slashes, leaving just Giovanni's Rhyhorn. Of course, I swap to... Oh, ho I faked you out. You thought I was going to go for Victory Bell, and I chose Clefable. This is because I want to go for Growl, so that I ensure Drill Run doesn't ruin Victory Bell's day on a non-critical hit. Getting two of them off before we enter and dodge a Drill Run on Switchin. That's perfect, since that's just more HP to survive a crit if it happens, though Rhyhorn shifts to using Megahorn as I miss a Razor Leaf, doing about 30% even through two Growls as the second Razor Leaf connects to Barely Not One Shot, taking one more for another 30% damage as the third and final Razor Leaf finishes it off. Man, physical grass types are just not built for Kanto. This kind of blows. Maybe it'll go better once we get access to Power Whip in the late game, but I'm not sure. Anyway, Eric is ready for battle straight after, and honestly, I think this is a perfect time for a Victory Bell sweep. I start with Chansey in order to use Thunder Wave and a few Growls on it, eventually bringing in Victory Bell once I realize it's just going to keep going for Mega Drain. Setting up four growths and starting to wail with Poison Jab, one-shotting Tangela, Weeping Bell, and Vileplume in sequence to win without going below half HP. I may still think Physical Grass types suck in this game, but Physical Poison types can do the job pretty well. Now at an appropriate level, it's time to add a new team member. The Fighting Dojo in Saffron City contains Hitmonchan, coming with all three elemental punches and Dizzy Punch, but doesn't get a good fighting move without the Brick Break TM from a coach trainer on Route 10. It also gets Bulk Up, though with no Mach Punch we're going to need some way to outspeed stuff, but we get access to agility, so again, no problem. One Jesse and James fight later, and we've got the Poke Flute, opening Fuchsia City, and access to other encounters and TMs that'll prove helpful for the rest of the challenge. Once done with TM Collection, though, with Sea Skim, I can head down into Route 21, grabbing a Staryu, which is dangerously close to the level cap 44 while being at 42, but that should be enough wiggle room to beat Sylphco, Koga, and Sabrina with it, evolving into Starmie with a Waterstone before being sent into battle. With that out of the way, Sylphco's ready to fall as Blue's in the way with Executor and Charizard, so I lead Clefable to outspeed and nail a Shadow Ball for just over half as Light Screen is set up, making this a three shot after taking a Psychic. That lowers my special defense as a third and final Shadow Ball lands, so I swap into Rhyhorn for Charizard, taking two Heat Waves and bringing Rhyhorn to just 13 HP, as a Rock Throw doesn't even do half thanks to a Burn. From here, it's a swap into Chansey as this can tank those special attacks, but I forgot to consider that this thing dies to any physical attack even resembling competent, so it dies to Slash and I'm back down to less to a full party. Not to worry though, Chansey wasn't really going to make it into the Elite Four team anyway, so I just took the safe swap into Starmie and got a revenge KO with Scald to win the fight. Probably could have just gone into that on a Heat Wave and outsped to KO, but hindsight's 2020. Thankfully, I can restock my ranks afterwards by heading into the power plant to capture Weezing, and right outside on Route 10 houses the encounter of Dratini. Yes, we are finally going to have a good use for Dragonite. That higher physical attack over special made me really not want to use this thing for any other Kanto games, due to being pre-physical special split, so now that we do have this at full power, this should make for a great encounter. 
I end up getting Dratini to evolve into Dragonair before using it in battle, holding off until level 42 to obtain Outrage early just in case, then giving Dark Pulse to Weezing for coverage. Lastly, we finally get Rhyhorn to evolve into Rhydon, so the squad is once again at full power, entering the main bit of Sylphco, taking out Archer as well as Jesse and James in quick fashion without losing any of our Pokemon, leaving just Giovanni. He leads Persian as I go for Weezing instead of Rhydon, as I want to preserve that for Nidoqueen, and Weezing just so happens to have really good physical defense, holding up against the likes of Fake Out and Slash just long enough for Sludge to 3-shot KO, leading to Rhyhorn. Out to Clefable we go to take a takedown for minimal damage, using Psychic for 80% all while dodging a drill run, putting me in perfect position to KO with the second Psychic, leaving just Nidoqueen. Now this monster doesn't actually have a poison move, so Clefable's clear to stay in and lay in with Psychic, taking a body slam after just doing over half damage with Psychic, but of course we get paralyzed. Truly, it feels like this move has a 30% chance not to paralyze. We're also immobilized for the next turn as she goes for a second body slam, if I miss another Psychic attempt, I'm gonna have to swap, but thankfully after another Body Slam, we managed to hit. It would have been fine to swap out if we missed another Psychic, but at the end of this turn, Clefable affections out of Paralysis, so we're able to outspeed once again, KOing with Psychic and freeing Sylph from Giovanni's grasp. I mean, I'll take the cheap win, safer than risking any of my other Pokémon at least. Especially when we go into the disaster that is Koga. Honestly, I have so many other Pokemon that I could capture here in Let's Go Eevee, now that we're in the last Kanto game and I don't have to worry about reserving these Mons for a long time, but I wanted to be stingy and conserve encounters wherever I could to keep my count as low as possible. And because of that, I'm now suffering the consequences of my actions. He leads Weezing as I go with Starmie in the attempt to just block an explosion with Protect, opting for Psychic on turn 2 as he goes for Protect, but of course on turn 3 we barely miss yet another KO with Psychic and take a Toxic, so Starmie's gonna be incapacitated after a couple turns. Though after a turn of Weezing's Protect, Scald does KO and lead into Venomoth, which is... oddly enough the most dangerous thing on this team, so I swap into Rhydon to resist and... Hold up, does Rock not resist Bug? When the f*** was that not a thing? Oh, that sucks, because Bug Buzz just did over half, and I was planning on running through this thing with Rhydon, and now my whole plan's gone out the window. My entire team is weak to this thing, as Weezing, Victory Bell, and Hitmonchan die to Psychic, Clefable dies to Sludge Bomb, and Starmie dies to Bug Buzz, so I am in a really big pickle. I decide to swap into Weezing to resist Bug Buzz, but since we don't outspeed, after Protect blocks out Dark Pulse, we just die to Psychic, going out into Clefable in the hopes to survive a Sludge Bomb and hit Psychic, which we do. Unfortunately, that only did around 70% and didn't KO, so after using Protect, I'm basically stuck. I swap for Victory Bell for the neutrality, but it still does half damage, and thanks to not outspeeding, dead to a Psychic. Two down for me as Starmie takes the Revenge KO, taking toxic damage as Golbat comes in and uses Protect. Probably should have known that would happen, should have taken the turn to use Recover, especially when Leech Life does over half damage. Are you kidding me right now? Why is everything just almost completely going out of control? I swap in a ride on for physical defense and we do survive two Leech Lifes, using Rock Throw for over half, with the third leaving ride on on literally 1 HP, not an affection activation by the way, in order to KO with Rock Throw and leave just Muck. Now with only Hitmonchan at full HP, I'm putting my hopes into sacking Rhydon and hoping to outspeed with a Drill Run, but I guess Muck is faster and just destroys it with Moonblast. That sucks. Plan B is going into Clefable and outspeeding with Psychic, doing just under half before going down to a Sludge Bomb. Only two members left, and Starmie's basically my last hope, outspeeding thankfully and hitting Psychic to KO and win the fight. Well, shit, I, uh... I mean, I'm pretty much at a loss for words at this point. I did not expect Let's Go Eevee to be the closest thing to a wipe that we've had in quite some time, but here we are, I guess, with only Hitmonchan, Starmie, and Dragonair. Thankfully, all of these were preserved for the League, so I'm not too worried. Now to refill the team after that massacre, as Pokemon Tower contains Cubone, Route 12 has Horsey, and while I have used Kingdra in a previous run, I never used Seedra in battle, which was the one that I captured, and that's all I can access here, so free team member. And then the last one is on Route 11 with Drowsy, putting me back in a full team. Not a fan of having multiple duplicate water and psychic types, but I don't really have that much of a choice at this point. My only other options are Aerodactyl, which will die to Sabrina at the flick of a Psychic, Ditto, which without an ability means I have to waste a turn on Transform and lose HP because of it, 
Shelter, which dies to Sabrina thanks to having paper special defense, and Snorlax I really want to preserve for a later game since I feel like it'll be so much more useful in either the Sinnoh remakes or Legends Arceus. But with this team, I'm feeling at least decently confident in my chances, getting Marowak, Seedra, and Hypno before going in and hopefully without another Pyrrhic victory. First up is Mr. Mime, so I lead with Hypno as I've got access to Nasty Plot, raising my special attack by 6 stages in 3 turns to KO with 2 Shadow Balls. Perfect timing to let the Light Screed established by Mr. Mime on turn 1 elapse as Alakazam enters second, with Hypno just over half HP. No special defense drops though, so I'm safe to stay in and take a weak Psychic, finally seeing the drop as Shadow Ball KOs, leading to Slowbro. Hypno outspeeds and KOs this in one shot with Shadow Ball, which leaves just Jinx, and if I dodge Lovely Kiss here, this is probably the end of the fight. But if not, we're in a little bit of a war here, and of course it doesn't, meaning that Hypno is toast to Ice Punch if I don't get the heck out of dodge. Stormy resists both of Jinx's attacks though, so I swap to take a Psychic for half damage, using Flash Cannon since, what the heck, this thing gets Flash Cannon by TM. It does slightly under half as Lovely Kiss misses, letting me use a second as Sabrina forgoes Lovely Kiss to opt for another Psychic. Sealing her fate as a third and final Flash Cannon puts Jinx six feet under to win the fight without another casualty. Whew, I was friggin' tense during that fight because of what had just happened with Koga. Since the snowball effect of Nuzlocks is starting to feel really real at this point as a potential threat, and I need to make sure not to lose anything else, or I might wipe, and if that happens, that's game over for this series as I have nothing else left to clear Let's Go Eevee with starting at the beginning of the game, let alone Let's Go Pikachu. Admittedly, I don't have to worry about that with Blaine though, thanks to multiple water and ground types. Blaine's leading Magmar as I've got Seedra in the hopes to just one-shot this thing with Hydro Pump before any damage can occur, but Magmar outspeeds and lands Confuse Ray, muddying up my plans. Honestly, I thought that this was a freak occurrence, but looking at the stats, I had no idea that Magmar had a base 93 speed and Seedra was lagging behind at a base 85. Probably should have looked that up beforehand and started with Starmie. After hitting itself and missing the second attempt following a flamethrower though, the second flamethrower connects, bringing Seedra down to mid-yellow HP, but we do manage to hit the Hydro Pump this turn, KOing and leading to Arcanine. Oh, well, this sucks. Guess I'm going out to Hitmonchan to tank, and that doesn't even do enough as Outrage does over half, so I swap in a Marowak for some decently high defense once again, and it's over half again. However, Arcanine's confused due to fatigue, so I can swap out into Starmie and take a Flare Blitz, using Recover in the hopes to fiend for a self-hit with Confusion, which does occur and lets Starmie get back to full HP and KO with a Surf as Rapidash comes out third. Surf ends up barely not KOing, proving that not having EVs is really screwing with what I would expect to be one-shots, as Flare Blitz connects for less than half, but of course burning. Well then, I may as well spam Recover since Blaine doesn't have any healing items, letting Rapidash KO itself with a second Flare Blitz, as Nine Tails is all that remains. I use Recover once again and take Fire Blast for about a quarter, letting me use Surf next turn for 75% as another Fire Blast lands to bring Starmie down to around a third along with the burn damage, but since I outspeed, Surf KOs to finish the battle. Oh, well, that was fine. I, it would have been a lot worse if Arcanine hadn't hit itself, but I did have the power points to spare with Recover, so I'm sure it was salvageable. All we have left is Giovanni's Gym, and I forgot the way to get through this thing. Again, I kept thinking I needed to go up instead of to the left, and then I ended up fighting a trainer. This ended up being the Nidoking trainer. Remember when this thing killed Onyx in the last run? Yeah, it did the same thing to Marowak. I gotta love entirely preventable mistakes. <sighs> Thankfully, nothing else goes down during the gym, though once again, my brain misfires and I forget to grab Aerodactyl beforehand, meaning I have no pivot for ground type moves. Will that end the run? Well, let's find out. He leads Doug Trio and myself with Seedra, not that it matters since everything's gonna get outsped and nailed with a massive earthquake. At least here I can retaliate with Surf after taking half damage to KO and lead into Nitto King. Now Hitmonchan should be able to take the EQ, so I swap only to be proven wrong once again about his defense. So I swap back into Seedra, barely tanking the attack on 2 HP in order to outspeed and fire back with a one-shot Hydro Pump. I eh, guess I should have stayed in and outsped earlier. Next is Rhydon, a one-shot with a quad effective Surf, leaving just Nidoqueen. From here, it's an easy swap into Hypno, taking Earthquake and Crunch on around 25% HP before hitting Psychic for 50%, and that's about enough for Hypno, so I swap into Dragonair on a Crunch, hitting Waterfall for the hopes of a flinch, but no dice. However, since I outspeed and take an Earthquake without being KO'd, I can just Waterfall on the Crackback to KO and win the fight. 
Once again, being careless and not remembering Pokemon base stats, let alone encounters, nearly costed me. But we're gonna cool down, we're not gonna underestimate the last rival, or the League. So I go back, grab Aerodactyl, get the team up to level 53, and get serious. Trace leads off with Pidgeot as I go for Starmie, an easy outspeed to hit it with Thunderbolt, but this is no longer a one-shot, instead doing a little over half as Sand Attack lands. I go for it again, but that results in him swapping to Raichu to tank it, and go for Thunder as I swap into Dragonair for the resistance. Of course though, Dragonair gets paralyzed since my luck is terrible, but thankfully dodges a slam as I get held down by Paralysis, hitting Dragon Tail next turn after Slam connects to drag out Vileplume. This, thankfully, is also resisted, so I take a Petal Dance to bring Dragonair down into the red, as Dragon's Hail once again hits, and brings in the half HP Raichu. I gotta swap here, and with this HP, I feel like Hypno should be able to get the KO with Psychic. But of course, once again, we miss a KO by an inch, and get punished by Thunder hitting and paralyzing. Can you please stop, you annoying rat bastard? I try to salvage the attempt as now Trace has healing items, going for a max potion as I go for Nasty Plot, bringing him down to red HP with Psychic yet again, before swapping into Hitmonchan hoping for a second max potion, not coming along as Thunder Punch hits and gets a third Paralysis, this time with the 10% move. I'm gonna lose my goddamn mind. This game is out to kill my run and I will not have it! Thunder lands next turn for less damage than Thunder Punch, weirdly, but I do manage to hit Earthquake to finish it, bringing Pidgeot back into the fight. Here I can expect a flying move, swapping to Aerodactyl to take a light air slash before firing Rock Slide to KO. Two down, two to go as Vileplume comes out next, going for Fly to dodge anything it throws at me. Except Toxic? Why is that able to hit during a semi-invulnerable turn? I mean, I know Toxic is 100% accurate when used by poison types, but that's egregious as all hell. Thankfully though, the fly does KO, leaving just Marowak. I go for Crunch as he sets up Focus Energy, doing some light chip damage that will probably be enough for Cedar to come in and clean this up with Surf, and sure enough, as I swap into a dangerous sword stance, we do outspeed and nail the KO with the victory. This game is about this close to getting me to snap, but I can taste victory. With one more victory road complete, I'm pretty much ready to challenge the league, barring a few TMs that I've yet to pick up, getting a few heart scales from Cerulean City to reteach important moves like agility to Hitmonchan for bulk up sweeping, and finally, evolving Dragonair into Dragonite at the level cap of 55. Now we're packing some heat, let's go Eevee kick some ass. Hey, I still have to include some humorous bits and bad puns somewhere, or else I'm just gonna devolve into deranged rambling and anger. Anyway, Lorelei starts Dugong as I go with Hypno, setting up Reflect so that Hitmonchan can come in and take as little damage as possible, seeing as we don't have any recovery moves, so we need to keep defenses high. Three bulk ups are set up before it elapses, taking four waterfalls in the process before setting up the fourth, fifth, and sixth, all while Waterfall gets us under half, though we do dodge the second to last one before one agility can be set up, and the sweep begins. Thunder Punch on Dugong, Fire Punch on Jinx, then Thunder Punch on Slowbro, Cloyster, and Lapras seals the deal all with one shots to win the fight. I knew I was gonna need plus six for those last two, and Hitmonchan did the job perfectly. As for Bruno, the same strategy applies, using Hypno's Reflect before swapping and setting up bulk ups. Instead of having two attacking moves though, I stuck with only stab, brick break, and included rest. Something I wish I had the capacity to do with Lorelei, but just couldn't with Jinx being too much of a threat. And I'm glad I went with that option, as Hitmonchan was nailed with not just one, not two, but three criticals from Onyx before finishing the setup. Eventually KOing Onyx, Polyrath, Machamp, and Hitmonlee with Brick Break before the final standoff in the mirror match. Who's the true champion of box- oh, who am I kidding, it's my Hitmonchan. Glad we paid off the Athletics Commission for all of that rampant steroid use in the middle of the ring. It's a miracle what money can do. Anyway, next up is Agatha, and that damn Arbok is sitting once again in my path with Glare paralyzing anything, so I'm just gonna go for Dragonite. With Earthquake and Ice Punch, I can work my way through this fight and disregard setup moves, aside from agility just to bypass the speed slashing of Paralysis. Though getting affection to proc and get rid of Paralysis upon KOing Arbok with Ice Punch, and with an agility already set up, I think that seals the deal. Out comes Gengar, the level 54 ace, as this one has Dazzling Gleam for super effective damage, but we all know Gengar has paper thin defense, so we KO that and Gengar number 2 back to back with 2 earthquakes leading to Weezing. Now I know this isn't going down in 1 earthquake, let alone 2 as Sludge Bomb hits and poisons Dragonite. Not a problem though, as Roost can keep Dragonite healthy enough, using 2 in a row to get to around 2 thirds following another Sludge Bomb, hitting another earthquake right after. 
Weasling's in the red as Dragonite goes down to around 40% off of another Sludge Bomb, but Affection is pulling double duty as we get out of Poisoning. Great opportunity here to heal up as much as possible with Roost in preparation for Golbat, using two of them as two Sludge Bombs connect, and once again we're poisoned. I guess that's the good old greed coming back to bite me in the ass, though I finally KO this big old stinky boy with Ice Punch. Oh, never mind, Fetching triggers again. Not that it matters, since Golbat really can't capitalize on our current HP anyway, leaving it to die to two Ice Punches and win me the fight. Okay, I'm feeling good again. Three battles that went pretty much as I was hoping for. Let's make sure that Lance does not end up ruining the run, though. He leads Seedra and myself with Starmie. I put Light Screen here because I'm going to try sweeping with Hypno, swapping out and taking a Hydro Pump while under Light Screen, then going for Calm Mind, opting to swap Nasty Plot for it since that special defense boost is paramount. We've got three of them set up as Light Screen dissipates and Seedra runs out of Hydro Pump, so this should be an open and shut case. Well, after I use all of my nonsense and play around crits with rest. With that, I set up Reflect and take one last Dragon Pulse before firing off Psychic to KO, leading to Aerodactyl. He goes for Rock Slide, but he misses, so that's a free Psychic for me. Gyarados is out third, and once again another physical attacker, outspeeding with Waterfall, and once again missing thanks to Affection. Boy, this mechanic is making this a lot less tense, though Psychic manages to miss the one-shot. Stab plus six is still not enough, that's kind of a shocker, but we don't get flinched on the second Waterfall, so that's another KO as Charizard enters next. I was hoping for Charizard specifically here to set up one more Reflect following a rest, as he doesn't have any physical moves, but that last Pokemon in Dragonite is a big threat with Outrage. Easily executing that line of play, Hypno KOs with Psychic at the end of it, then Dragonite comes out and lands Outrage for a little under half. Psychic connects, finishing the... Oh, what the hell? Two Pokemon survive a plus six Sab Psychic? Well, Dragonite's locked into Outrage and can't heal. Just gotta dodge one critical hit, and boom, one last Psychic ends the battle and our second to last battle of Gen 7. After a few minutes of TM shakeup, I think I'm ready. One last blockade before getting to the Gala region, and with a full squad of six still live and kicking, we should be alright. Trace leads Pidgeot, I lead Starmie, and we're just going to do the same thing again. Hypno Sweep seems like the most effective plan A, while still having Hitmonchan in play for after Pidgeot, in case things go south. But this starts out effectively enough by setting up Light Scream with Starmie, swapping into Hypno on an Air Slash, and then getting to Calm Mind. However, he does shift to using Quick Attack, totaling to around half damage before Light Screen dissipates. Now, to ensure my survival through a critical hit, I go for Reflect, then Rest to restore all of that lost HP, and just in time as Air Slash gets a critical. Not good as Reflect just wore off following another Calm Mind too, so I go for Rest without setting up another one in hopes that him keeping on Quick Attack will mean that criticals do a lot less, and judging on this damage, that's probably for the best. Getting up my last Calm Mind as we dodge Air Slash, set up Reflect, and go for one more Rest. I'm gonna need as much HP as possible for the rest of this fight, and thankfully, Affection once again comes in clutch as we dodge two air slashes in a row, leaving just one to connect for very minimal damage as Psychic KOs Mega Pidgeot, Vileplume, and Rapidash after a Flare Blitz does over half, leading to Raichu. Now I know this thing has Iron Tail, and there's no way I'm gonna survive anything past that attack if I don't go for rest now, doing so as Iron Tail brings Hypno down into the red. Just have to dodge a few defense drops, and hilariously, we wake up out of rest thanks to Affection to set up Reflect once again, going for Psychic next turn and dodging another Iron Tail to leave us on around 75% HP as Slowbro enters 5th. Here's our brick wall though, as I forgot to use all my PowerPoint ups on Psychic to give me 16 uses of it. And this guy has Light Screen. Neck, even plus 6 stab Psychic before Light Screen only does a little over half, so I'm kinda just stuck staring at him. The best way for me to do this, though, would be to just use it, outlast Light Screen for five turns after outspeeding with that Psychic, then KO and lead into his final Pokemon in Marowak, but using Rest during some of these points just did not line up correctly. In hindsight, though, I probably should have just used the last eight power points of Calm Mind to stall while waiting for the Light Screen to dissipate, but instead I decided to just waste the remaining points of Psychic before setting up Reflect and swapping into Starmie for the double resistance. After all, I have super effective attacks for both remaining Pokemon, so it shouldn't matter that much anyway. Light Screen does need to be set up, though, since those Surfs and Psychics are doing a little too much damage, but aside from that, I just need to rotate between Thunderbolt and Recover, eventually KOing as Light Screen ends, leaving just Marowak. Surf is able to connect to... and nearly KO. 
I'd complain, but I'm going to win anyway. I don't have the energy for this anymore. Bone Meringue hits to bring Starmie into the low yellow, but it's all sealed up as I outspeed, and Trace goes for a full restore, heal locking him into a 2 hit KO and a chaotic meatball victory. And with that, that's Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, cleared without using any stat altering candies. Sorry about this taking like two weeks, by the way. I was going back and forth on whether or not it would be fair to use those, did the first run of Pikachu, got mad that it wasn't entertaining enough, aside from it being a funny little bush killing everything on sight, which admittedly is funny, but you kind of get tired after that. Then I had to replay the game again, which was kind of demoralizing, since I felt like I had just gotten halfway done, only to be back at the beginning, which is why I wanted to include it in the video, since I wanted that work to at least go towards something. At least now, it feels like a funny bit instead of that being the entire focus and giving you guys a boring video. With that said, thanks for watching the video. Once again, I want to give huge shoutouts to this video's sponsor, War Thunder, the ultimate vehicle combat game. Remember, you can personalize your vehicles, enjoy stunning graphics, and immerse yourself like never before. And if you're a new player or returning after a break, grab your bonus package using my link for 7 days of premium account, 100,000 silver lions, and a progress boosting booster. The link is in the pinned comment, and if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so we can hit 200,000 soon, drop a like on the video, it really helps out. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.